Hello students, uh, welcome to this week's lecture. We're going to talk today about uh, the principles of design. So let's get going with our learning objectives for this lecture. So we'll begin by talking about uh, a symmetry as well as asymmetry, and then we'll also talk about radial balance. We'll explain the relationship between emphasis and focal point. And then we'll d differentiate between scale and proportion. And as part of that, I've actually posted a video for you, a short video about five minutes long, which is about Polyclitus's Doriferous. And this is a sculpture that kind of embodies proportionality, especially in early Greek art, which then informed uh, uh, most later art in terms of proportion and ideal proportion specifically. Uh, and then at the end of today's lecture, we'll talk about pattern and repetition. But I'd like to start here with the Vitruvian Man. This is a study by Leonardo da Vinci. It's in your book. And I'd like to start here because it embodies all the qualities of design that are really important for this chapter. Um, so symmetry, proportion, and ratio all, de all derive from uh, the perfection of the human figure, okay? So the figure's limbs, as you can see here, they actually perfectly fit into a f uh, two separate frames. One is the frame of the circle and one is the frame of the perfect square, okay? So this is all the, the study of the human body is completely tied into mathematics and science in this way. Um, so it's no um, a surprise, of course, that we have these early theorists who are not only dabbling in uh, art practice, but are also inventors, uh, theorists in a variety of ways, mathematicians, all these types of things. So these are all kind of what you would call Renaissance men, right? And if you live in the McAllen area, or if you live in uh, the Rio Grande, Rio Grande Valley, you've probably seen this logo before, right? So you see the, uh, the Vitruvian Man here, and then you see it's actually the logo for Doctor's Hospital at Renaissance, which is a, a really large hospital down here in the valley. So many of us have seen it uh, many times before. It's become kind of a pop culture icon, like everybody kind of knows of the Vitruvian Man. Um, but here the origins were actually in this drawing, this sketch uh, by, by Da Vinci from 1492. So when we look here to the da Vinci, we see, of course, proportionality, right? The ideal proportions, we see balance. Uh, we'll get, we'll uh, get to the definitions of these things in just a second. We see symmetry, right? So half the, uh, if we divided the uh, drawing down the middle, everything would be basically the same on either side. Um, so this is kind of the ideal um, kind of order uh, within within an art piece. But then when we move here, we see artists are also oftentimes challenging this uh, order. So we have Frank Gehry, who's a prominent architect. Many of you might have heard of his work before. Um, if you haven't heard of him, you've probably seen one of his buildings without knowing it. But here you also have balance, right? I'd actually still argue that there's balance, even though we don't see symmetry and we don't necessarily see order. So instead of having a symmetrical balance where we have one side completely like the other, we have two sides that are actually very, very different, right? This side seems slightly more orderly, um, while this side seems to kind of move in a kind of um, uh, choreographed way. So the artist himself, Frank Gehry, uh, in this architectural piece, was actually interested in movement and choreography, right? And so you almost see the curve of the, uh, the architecture here as seems to be kind of akin to the curve of the hip as you move through space, right? As you move your body, as you dance. And so um, the artist was interested in rhythm and dance, and these are the types of things that informed this building. But I would also say that there's still balance here, right? Even though the sides are completely different, they kind of balance one another out, right? Here we've got kind of um, order in terms of um, composition, and then over here you've kind of got disorder. But they work together to balance out the composition. Um, so balance. What is balance? Balance refers to the even distribution of weight in a composition. So in works, balance can often be one of three things. It can be symmetrical. We've already been talking a little bit about this. It can also be asymmetrical, or it can be radial. And we've looked at this piece before, I just wanted to bring it up again, so I'd ask you if we were in class, you know, do you think there's balance here? And hopefully you would say, yeah, I think so. Um, and I think that has to do with, you know, the center point here is the red shape, or the, uh, the black shape. If you were to divide the, uh, this down the center, you would not have symmetry, but you would have balance, right? Because either side basically has um, 
the same amount of positive and negative space on either side of this centralized black uh, shape. So when we first think about symmetry, uh, I like to bring up the Taj Mahal. So it's not just in paintings and drawings and prints that we see a symmetrical balance. We can also see this in architecture. So um, anytime we see symmetry, we should obviously think of Leonardo's study of the Vitruvian Man. So that is to say that each side is always exactly the same, and this is what we call absolute symmetry. But there are oftentimes uh, um, um, there are oftentimes when we've got minor discrepancies, right? When we've got all, almost absolute symmetry. But we have these minor discrepancies where the overall effect is symmetrical, but there's little differences here and there causing it to be uh, what we call oops, bilateral symmetry, okay? Um, so the Taj Mahal is actually a piece of architecture that um, is symmetrical. It's actually one of the most symmetrical buildings in the world. Um, and if you were to divide, to divide the building completely in half, you would see that actually the architect has made it as symmetrical as possible. Um, one of my students today in my class said, well, what about, the, um, what about the landscape around it? You know, is that involved in the symmetry? And I kind of had to say, no, uh, because nature will always do its own thing, right? You can try to do, you know, you can tell that um, the gardeners, the people who are in charge of the gardening space here, tried to make the space symmetrical by planting trees like this. Um, but, of course, nature will will have its, a mind of its own. Um, so here you could almost talk about this as um, bilateral symmetry because you almost have basic symmetry there but you have minute differences. Now as we think more about um, symmetrical balance we can look to the coronation of the Virgin. Here we have a painting where uh, in which we have base, a basic symmetry between sides, right? If we were to divide this in two in half and um, we would see that there's a basic overall kind of dominating symmetry within uh, within the piece, okay? And around the edges you have these small figures um, who kind of um, are obviously different, right? They kind of have similar colors in, in garb um, and they all look towards the center but they are specific people so they are different. So there are minute differences. As you look down to this part of the piece you see the central crucifix and then to either side there's some asymmetrical qualities as well. And so again this is what we'd call bilateral symmetry because the overall effect of the composition is symmetrical but then around the sides obviously we have these details that are different. And just to give you a little map of how we can find asymmetry uh, and how asymmetry can also uh, contribute to balance within a piece, we've got a couple options here. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I've taken this um, map from your book, okay? So feel free to look there for more details. So here, a composition that lacks symmetry can still be balanced, and this is what we call asymmetry. So for instance, if we were to have... Um, um, Sorry, my baby's crying. <laughs> I have to go get it in just a second. So if we were to have um, uh, in diagram A, we have obviously the central balance um, is here, a little bit to the left, with a larger figure over here. Um, but then if you have a smaller figure over here, because the central, uh, the center is over to the center, or because the um, it's not completely balanced on either side, but we have a smaller figure over here, you'll find balance in overall composition. The same goes for, for instance, in uh, diagram D. So here you've actually got a central point here, um, but on one side you're going to have a lighter figure that's bigger, and then on the other side a smaller figure that is perhaps more prominent in color. So that will end up um, kind of creating balance within the piece. So here, if I were to ask you um, about balance, how would you read this, okay? So hopefully you would say, well, there's a central axis that's just left of the middle. So as you can see, here's where kind of our central, uh, our, our vanishing point is, and we've talked about this in other lectures. So we've got a vanishing point. We follow these what we call orthogonals. Hopefully this isn't new for you. These lines that come back to the vanishing point, which is, again, on the horizon line. 
Um, and then we've got the darker kind of part over here and the lighter part over here. Um, so we've got a central axis left of the middle. And then we've got tension between light and dark. Okay, so we've got this darker part of the frame here, and then that's balanced with the lighter part over here. Same goes with kind of the openness and the uh, busyness of the street, right? We've got the busyness of the street on this side, and then kind of an expanse of lightness, uh, which is basically pretty open um, to snowfall, as you can see here. Um, over to the side. And I actually wondered today when I was teaching class, I asked my students if they'd even seen snow because we all live down in the valley here and they said, oh yeah, we've seen it once before. So I'd probably ask you that too if I was with you. All right, so also when we talk about balance, we talk about radial balance. And this is when everything radiates outward from a central point. So here I like to talk about rose windows. If you've ever been in a church, you've probably seen a rose window. Many churches uh, usually have these. Um, and as you can see, the central point of the composition is here at center, where you see Christ enthroned. And then everything else kind of radiates out from that center. So that's radial balance. We also see this with uh, architecture. So here we have kind of a centralized altar. Um, this is at the Church of Santa Costanza in Rome, and it's actually not a church, even though it's called the Church of Santa Costanza, because it is actually a tomb for Constantine, the emperor's daughter. Um, so she would have been uh, entombed right here uh, below this central space. But either way, you can see the radial, uh, radial balance. So at the center, we've got the emphasis. You can see here in this diagram as well. And then if you were to enter the space through here, you would walk around the central space. You do what we call circumambulation to walk around the space. Um, and the central space would be right here at the middle. And here to give you a look uh, inside of this church, um, there's the central spot uh, right away. And of course, the only place you can go is around. So you'd walk around emphasizing that radial balance. Um, another important element of, de of design this week is emphasis and focal point. So focal point, um, this is the area to which the artist draws the viewer's attention the most. So oftentimes when you have con uh, strong contrasts of light and dark, this can create a focal point easily. So here I've got uh, the still a still life with a lobster. And if I were to ask you, okay, where's the focal point here? Well, I've got the answer right here. So basically the focal point is right at the lobster. And this is because of the color. This is because of the bright color of the lobster, especially against the darker background, which is mostly kind of complementary to that kind of orangish red lobster. So most of the background is a bluish green. And if you remember looking at our color wheel, remember those are kind of the two complementary colors that we often see together, orange and blue, red and green. And then if we look here, uh, let's think about, um, uh, so we just talked about uh, the focal, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the focal point. And here uh, we also have a focal point, or what we call an emphasis. So if you recall, we've looked at this before. Remember the, uh, what before we were talking about um, uh, orthogonals that lead to a vanishing point, right? So we have the same type of thing here. And I do want to make this clear, though, that the focal point and the emphasis are not always going to be the vanishing point, but here um, they are the vanishing point. So um, if, we, if we draw invisible lines kind of coming down from these orthogonals, uh, creating these implied lines, right, um, everything would come down to right above Christ's head. So we know that's the, the uh, focal point within the piece. But then we have artists who are resisting this, right? We have artists who are not interested in focal points and are trying to kind of resist that, uh, within, especially within uh, the modern era. So we have Lucas Samaras, who's working in the 1960s. Um, this is um, a room number two, most popularly known as mirrored room. And so it's, as you can see, it's a large kind of box that you would enter into. Mirrors on the outside, but then if you look on the inside, you've got even more mirrors. So if you were to walk inside here, this is kind of what it would look like. Um, this is a picture that someone took with their phone as they were entering. And so you can see their reflection is completely jarred, right? It's not a, a mirror in the kind of traditional sense that we think of mirrors, right? We're walking into the space and we see something more like this. Okay, so even if we do see ourselves, it's completely disjointed uh, because of the layering of the mirrors in this space, okay? So this is the, where the artist is interested in the afocal, right? He doesn't want a singular focal point, but rather he's interested in um, 
a work that is afocal. There is no focal point. There's no way we could find a focusing point within this piece. And just a few fun facts. Only two visitors are allowed here simultaneously. Um, and the work, of course, becomes inseparable from the viewer. As I said, uh, mirrors, of course, include the viewer because you see your own reflection, but you become lost in that reflection, right? There's really no individuality within that uh, reflection because, as I said, it'll be completely distorted. And when we talk about scale and proportion, moving on, uh, scale describes the dimensions of an art piece in relation to the original object or objects around it. So I like to use this example actually here. Um, this piece we would call large scale, but when you look at it here, would you even imagine that it's 80 feet by 23 feet high? Probably not, right? It's most likely on your computer screen right now. I, I doubt that you've put this up on a large screen. Um, so it's probably, you know, a few inches by a few inches on your screen. And even if I do this, you're still not going to get the effect that it's 80 feet wide, right? You're still not going to get that. Um, and this is kind of the problem with uh, teaching lectures uh, with PowerPoints, um, is that we can never really kind of give you a great understanding of how big the piece is, even with images if we have, you know, a person standing next to it. Um, and that's why, you know, that's always the, the problem with these things is that we never can actually go to the paintings and see them ourselves. So I always encourage uh, us to go, uh, if we get the chance, to go to different museums around uh, Texas and elsewhere. All right, and so then um, when we talk more about, let's see, where was I, scale and proportion, here's another great example of scale. So here we have artists, um, Hokusai, so this is a Japanese artist, who's subverting the knowledge of how large this mountain is in the background. Okay, so if you, actually you can't see it here, I'll move that. Um, this is actually a depiction of Mount Fuji. If you know anything about Mount Fuji, it's actually one of the, or the, uh, largest mountain in Japan, right? Um, it's one of the largest mount, uh, volcano, volcanic mountains in the world. Okay, so this is a huge mountain. But look at how it's dwarfed here. It's rendered tiny um, in the wake of these giant, uh, these giant waves, I guess, literally in the wake of these giant waves. And so Mother Nature, uh, through the, uh, the emphasis of the water, is emphasized to, be, to being so much grander than the actual mountain itself, which is dwarfed in the background. And then we actually see these um, boats here, too. There's a couple of boats that all, almost seem to be swallowed up within the composition. Here is we've got these great waves um, that seem to kind of swallow everything else in the composition, diminishing the importance of Fuji itself. And so this is a, a, a diminishing of the scale of the mountain. And here's just an image of the mountain. If you were to actually see it, look at how tiny the town is below, right? This is one of the most uh, most gigantic mountains that, uh, volcanic mountains that we have. Um, and so it's interesting that the artist um, um, diminish its, diminishes its uh, size so much in, in this piece. And then we talk about proportion as an element of design. And proportion refers to the relationship between parts of an object and, whole, and its whole. So every time we talk about polyclitis, um, and you can see here I've got it spelled differently than, um, uh, than the, the, the uh, video I'm going to, that I'm offering you, because um, your book uh, offers it a little bit different. Um, but we've got a Greek, Greek sculptor, Polyclitus, who again was also a magician, or not a magician, uh, a mathematician. Um, so he's very interested in numbers and proportionality. And so he created a text that he called the canon. And the canon just basically for him meant the ideal uh, set of proportions, okay? And so this study of the human man, what he called Deriferous, otherwise known as the, the uh, spear bearer. Oh! I'm sorry, I, I just clicked on that accidentally and um, it uh, brought me to the video that you're going to be watching. So I'll let you watch that on your own because I have it linked in here. Um, yes, so here we have the spear, uh, spear bearer and both the text, right, the canon and the original Deriferous, as you see here, uh, were lost but both proclaim that each part of the body is a common fraction of the figure's height. So we know of this because there were writings about the text and because we have copies of the piece because um, this is a Greek sculpture but Romans were so interested in Greek art that they began copying the piece 
Um, and so we have their copies to remind us of that history. And here's just a kind of a nice uh, breakdown of one of the ways in which uh, Polycletus would have broken down the human body. Um, he would have measured the human head and said, okay, the body is seven times the human head. And that's just one of his very specific kind of predictions and uh, mathematical ways of um, creating the ideal proportions of the human body. Lastly, I want to talk about pattern and repetition. So pattern is a systematic repetition and rep a rep repetitive use of the same motif or design and is oftentimes used as a decorative tool. So here uh, I've brought up a kente cloth. Kente cloth are, cloths are um, traditional African garments usually. Um, this design comes from Africa um, and you oftentimes see um, Africans wearing this, uh, this design in a, a variety of ways. Um, but Akenta cloths used to be des designated only for people with social prestige. So that is to say, only for the kings and the queens, uh, people with lots of money. Because actually gold used to be um, intertwined into the Kente cloth, okay? And that's why you see gold as a prominent color here. Um, but nowadays, and more contemporarily, Kente cloth has become a much more popular um, item and so now everybody can kind of wear kente cloth. It's made much more cheaply, um, but nonetheless the pattern as a decorative tool persists. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about repetition. So, repetition can imply monotony, uh, but if certain elements are used repeatedly, they can create a visual rhythm. Okay, so here we have some specific pieces by Andy Warhol. These are probably not the pieces that you oftentimes think of when you think of Andy Warhol, um, but these are two um, from a series that uh, a series that he called the uh, Death and Destruction series. So he was very interested in popular culture, as many of you probably know. You've likely seen his images of Jackie Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe, uh, perhaps the Campbell soup cans. So we know that he's interested in popular culture. But here he's kind of making a statement about mass media. He was interested in the way in which mass media bombards us every day uh, with images of horror, right? Images of death, images of destruction, images of dying. Um, and so the images that he's taken here are actually taken from the, the daily newspaper. Um, and he's just re, uh, reprinted them repeatedly in this pattern uh, um, across the page to kind of get at the monotony of the uh, everyday press, right? The way that um, we're constantly bombarded with images of horror, right? And this is uh, something he was very passionate about. Um, he thought that this had an immense effect on our culture. Um, so um, the, the repetition has become so monotonous, as you can see here, green car crash from 1963, that we hardly even notice the details within it. It just becomes an overall composition of repetition, right? We don't really even look to the details. So we might not even notice um, that there's a man who's been who's hanging here from this um, telephone post. So this is the destruction of a car. This is a car crash. The car is flipped over and burning. And then the man has been projected from the car and is hanging in some way from um, something that was sticking out of this uh, post here. And he's repeated here with, uh, within the piece multiple times, right? But we oftentimes overlook that detail because of the monotonous kind of repetition of um, of the piece uh, itself, of the images within the piece. All right, so that's all for this lecture um, today. I want to end with uh, some discussion prep for you. And so you'll be asked today, uh, this week in your discussion, to think about two elements of design. Uh, you can feel free to think about more if that suits you. Two elements of design from this lecture and from this week's uh, chap this chapter for this uh, Tuesday lecture. Um, I think it's chapter 7. So you've got symmetry, asymmetry, radial balance, emphasis, focal point, scale, proportion, pattern, repetition, etc. I'm going to be asking you to define two of these elements of design and then discuss how you see them within your visual culture of your everyday life, your everyday experience. So in other words, how and where do you see specific design elements that you chose, that you chose uh, to talk about from day to day? For instance, I'm looking around the room, I'm looking around my house right now, and I see repetition in certain areas, I see patterns, 
Um, I see focal points as I look around. I see symmetry. So think about these things and how you see them around you every day and write your discussion post on those things. All right, hopefully that helps you to prepare.